Hi there, my name is David Kenny. Welcome to Light From Above. Glad you could be with us today. We're continuing our series and actually we'll conclude our series of lessons about the New Testament church. We've been talking about the church in different ways and different uh, avenues, if you will. We talked about the church in prophecy, in preparation, in power, in procession, in portrait, looking at several different pictures of the church. This picture of a church building here is one that's very precious to our family. And we'll be talking a little bit more about the idea, the concept, again, that that building is not the church. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Well, now we're sort of looking at the idea of the New Testament church and purpose. And we talked about one of the purposes of the church is to worship. And then also to evangelize is another purpose. Also to serve others is another purpose. Some people call that benevolence. Uh, also the idea of edifying, building one another up. Well, in this series, we're going to talk about the church. One of the purposes in the New Testament church is fellowship. It's one of the benefits that we have of being a part of the New Testament church. But you know, it's interesting, you know, when some people decide to become a Christian, some people do that at great risk to their lives. You read about that in the paper sometimes or on the internet, or even in our own country. Sometimes people, you know, when they become a Christian, they become ostracized uh, by their own family. And, and that still happens even to this day. But you know what? Jesus talked about that. Jesus spoke about that. And notice what's written in Mark chapter 10, 29 through 30. So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Now, that he's, telling, he's telling us that you, know, you may face persecution or bullying or you may, you, know, you may be ostracized by your own family. And, th and that happens. And notice that even in that passage, he talks about that you'll inherit all these things. You know, you'll have a spiritual family. You'll have spiritual brothers and sisters. And you'll have great acquaintances and friendships. It'll run deep because you become a Christian. But there's also persecutions promised in there even with that. And so you might ask yourself, well, well, why would I do that? Well, one of the great blessings about being a part of the New Testament church and one of the purposes of Christians in the church relates to fellowship. And we're going to talk about that. We're, first, we're going to look at we'll give you an outline of our study. We'll talk about the definition of fellowship and then the boundaries of it and then areas of fellowship and blessings of fellowship. But let's take a look at first uh, the definition of fellowship and what it means. Now this, it tells you here that, that it appears 20 times in 18 verses, this Greek word konaios, and uh, koneo, and you need to uh, recognize the fact that it has the idea of communion, uh, communication, distribution, or to, to communicate. Uh, fellowship uh, is that term there that we have, uh, koinea. Now, if you go and you look at Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words, it explains it a little further, and it says, A communion, a fellowship, a sharing in common, from koinos, common, is translated communion in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, Philemon 1, 6, Revised Version Fellowship. Uh, for the AV communication, it is most frequently translated fellowship, that which is the outcome of fellowship, a contribution, for example, Romans 15, 26, and 2 Corinthians 8, chapter 4. You know, when we join clubs, social clubs, it's, it's interesting, you know, some people think that when you join the church or when you're added to the church, that's another concept that people sometimes don't recognize, you don't really join a church, you're baptized and the Lord adds you to the church. Well, another one of those things, concepts that people seem to fail to understand, they think the church doesn't have any rules or it doesn't have any conditions and you can just do whatever you want to do. Um, or they're offended that you actually contribute money uh, to the church. But think about the idea of, of, another, of other clubs that you may join or be a part of. Uh, for example, um, when I was younger, I used to be in the Boy Scouts. I had to, ha I had to wear a uniform. Uh, I had to read the Boy Scout manual. I had to pay dues. I had to show up at meetings. I had to do all these things to be recognized as a part of the Boy Scouts of America. And we know other examples like that. And so the idea that the church doesn't have uh, restrictions or rules or guidelines and it doesn't expect, thing of its, expect things of its members is not very realistic. And it's something that, you know, we need to be honest with people and tell them, make sure they know what they're getting into. There are boundaries to fellowship. Let's take a look at this passage. This is 1 John chapter 1, 6 through 8. 
If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now notice here that fellowship is conditional. It's conditional. You have to obey the truth. You have to follow the truth. You have to do what Jesus has told you to do. I mean, turn over to Mark 16, 15 through 16, and you'll read there, you'll find out that one of the commands that Jesus gave is you have to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins if you want to be saved. But you have a lot of churches that'll say, oh, you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. That's not necessary. I mean, that's, if you want to do something like that, that might be a good sign, outward sign of what you believe, but it's not really essential. But is it? Jesus commanded it. You know, command... <laughs> There is no such thing as non-essential commands. You're supposed to do them. And that's something that you know, if we want to have fellowship, we have to follow the teachings of Christ, not the opinions of man. And that's something we need to realize, that there are boundaries to fellowship. And when it comes to religion and Christianity, we, we ought to have a very clear picture of what that is. Notice this statement. This is from Alan Hires. He was writing about the subject of fellowship. And he makes this very good statement. It says, It is therefore a condition of fellowship that we walk in the truth even as God is in the light. We not only have fellowship with one another, but with the Father and the Son, 1 John 1, 3. It has been said that fellowship is both horizontal and vertical, both with God and with men. But it should be added that we must first be in fellowship with the Father and the Son in order to be in a scriptural fellowship one with another. And the point he's making is very important and one that people seem to... You know, they seem to just sort of skim over, or they assume it. They say, well, as long as we're all getting along, then God's automatically going to accept that. But is He? You know, when we, when we say that we're Christians, and we follow, you know, we're supposed to be following God's Word, and if we're not paying attention to it, if we're not heeding it, then can we say that we're really in fellowship? Who knows? You have to study the Word of God to make sure. And that ought to be first. You want to make sure in the grand scheme of things, your whole life, you want to make sure that you have a proper relationship in proper fellowship with God. And then these other matters are either going to fall into place or they're going to fall by the wayside. It just depends. But you cannot jeopardize fellowship with God. You can't ignore that. And that's something that I'm afraid a lot of people, they don't pay attention to. Or they just assume that they have it if they're all getting along. They make that assumption. But are they following the truth? Are they following the truth? Let's take a look at another passage. This is Ephesians chapter 5, 8 through 13. For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. For all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes, whatever makes manifest is light. You know, Christians, you have to be very careful. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, dichotomy. It's an interesting th thing to try to do. You know, we, we want to have friends and we want to influence people. And, and to do that, you know, it's not just conversation. You do things with them. You're involved in their lives. Well, sometimes they're involved in things that you can't be involved in. Sometimes they th say things that you can't go along with. Sometimes you're involved in activities that you really need to stay out of. But yet the Christian is supposed to be, you know, they're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. And sometimes that's really difficult. Sometimes we may start something and realize, wait a minute, I can't really be involved in this. And then we have to pull back. And it's something that, you know, we really need to be aware of. But we always have to keep in mind that we have to stand for the truth. We have to stand for God's truth. If we're involved in things that are not right, we need to make sure we correct those things. And if other people, you know, we need to help them understand the choices that we're making and by what authority we're making those choices. And that they really ought to follow that teaching as well. But sadly, a lot of people just... They just go along with it, and they don't think much about it. And that's something that, you know, it's difficult. It's a challenge. I mean, sometimes being a Christian isn't the most popular thing you can be. But you're going to have to make that decision. You're going to have to make those choices. Those choices are going to have consequences. 
sometimes they're going to be negative. Sometimes, oftentimes, in this world, they're positive. And then in the next world, they're all positive. So that's something we need to keep in mind. Incidentally, the word fellowship, and let's look at this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 14 through 16. There's a different word here than the original word we looked at, but it's still talking about fellowship. But look at this passage. Says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell within them, walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. You know, we have to be very attentive that, you know, that we're abiding by the teachings of Jesus Christ. And if we have to make a choice, we better make the right choice. And, and there's consequences if we don't do that. I mean, if we, if we walk in the light, we'll be fine. But if we walk in darkness, we're going to be lost. Now, some people in this community, they don't teach such a thing. They teach once you're saved, there's nothing you can do because all that decision has been made before the foundation of the world. Really? Well, why would we have warnings like this? What would these warnings have anything to do with? I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, and we were talking about the idea of, you know, this idea of Calvinism, this uh, unconditional election kind of thing, which is basically the teaching that God has determined who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost, and it's, it was done before the foundation of the world, and there's nothing you could do about it. And I often wondered about that viewpoint, and I asked myself the question, if that were really true, why would we even have a Bible? I mean, why would Jesus even come to the earth? Why, you know, if, if God has made all the decision and we have nothing to do with it, why would we do that? Why would we be concerned about having fellowship with Jesus or with one another? Why would we even be teaching on that? Because it does matter. These things do matter. There are serious consequences that we are going to have to live with based on our decisions. Well, what about the idea of areas of fellowship? Let's take a look at Acts chapter 2, 41 through 47. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all men. Well, notice, you know, this is the early church. The he there, uh, talk about his word, talk about Peter. He's, this is on Pentecost. He's teaching. These, these people responded and they were baptized and they were added to the church. And they had these things in common that they followed. That term common, they had these things in fellowship. They had these things in common and they did these things together. And, and they did that by continuing in the Apostles' Doctrine. And they spent time with one another. They ate meals together. They went from house to house. The things that are there in the early church are, you know, it's very encouraging. But they face very stiff opposition too. And they would have to draw together and support one another. Well, let's take a look. You know, the idea of, of areas of fellowship certainly includes Christ as we commune around the Lord's Supper. I mean, that's definitely one of those times. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 15 through 17. I speak as to wise men, judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of the blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body. For we all partake of that one bread. Now, it's interesting, you know, sometimes... Sometimes when you partake of the Lord's Supper, sometimes we call that communion. It's that term, koinea. It's interesting, that idea, you know, communion. We're, we're having fellowship. We're having fellowship with, you know, brothers and sisters in Christ as we all observe these things. And we, you know, we say these prayers together and we think about Jesus' sacrifice. And we think about the body and we think about uh, the blood. And it's important that we think about that. You know, some people, they pervert the Lord's Supper, and they just do whatever they want to do. And some of them, you know, I, I don't know, it's something you really, you really need to think about. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 29. And it says this, For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, 
not discerning the Lord's body. What's that mean? It means you're not paying attention to what you're doing. It's a very solemn thing. I mean, you're, you're actually communing with each other and with Jesus Christ, and you're remembering the sacrifice that Jesus made. I mean, the, the bread represents his body. The blood represents his, his blood. We have that fellowship with one another because of Jesus' great sacrifice. We are brothers and sisters in Christ because of Christ's work. He brought us all together. So, you know, when we surround the Lord's Supper table and we commune, that is a major area of fellowship, one that we need to be mindful of. You know, sometimes, um, and I don't really mean to be hypercritical with this, but it's just something I want you to think about. Sometimes, maybe you're in a service sometime, at a church service, and someone might say, you know, people are visiting, and they're talking, and, and it's time for the services to begin. And sometimes you'll hear someone get up and they'll say uh, something like this, well, I hate to interrupt all this fellowship, but now it's time for our worship services to begin. And I may have said that, I don't know. But I want you to think about that for a moment. Worship is fellowship. You know, maybe you might want to say something like this. Um, I hate to interrupt your fellowship with one another, but now it's time for our services to begin, and we will continue our fellowship not just among each other, but we will be fellowshipping with God as we worship Him, His Son, and the Holy Spirit together. You see, worship is fellowship too. Sometimes people have this idea that you know, fellowship is just getting together, having a good time. It is, but that's not all that it is. And it's something that we need to be mindful of. You know, sometimes uh, we need to recognize that, you know, sometimes we have ideas and concepts that just you know, we've inherited, or maybe not inherited might not be the right word, but we were taught things, and maybe we find out that it isn't the, that way at all. Let me give you an example. Uh, remember the picture of the church building that I showed you earlier. I told you how that building is not the church. Well, I was speaking uh, someplace in West Virginia one time, and and I was staying with a very nice couple, and the lady, she's very nice. This is not to be critical of her. But she told me, she said, you know, I have a problem eating inside the church building. So I just have a problem with it. I just don't feel that it's right. And what, they, what this congregation had done is they had actually built an outdoor pavilion, and they would eat outside. And they told me that sometimes black bears came down out of the hills and ate with them. Well, I didn't get to have any fellowship with any black bears. But I asked her, and she was very nice, and we had a very good conversation. I asked her, I said, well, what happened before that pavilion was built? And she said, well, we just ate outside. And I said, if it rained? And she sort of smiled at me, and she said, we went inside the church building. You see, some people, you know, and I don't mean to be hypercritical of people. I just want you to think. You know, the, some people, in an effort to try to follow the scriptures, as closely as they can, and I admire that, but sometimes they go too far. Are we allowed to eat in a building? Are we allowed to eat in a church building? It's something that we need to keep in mind, something that we really need to give thought for, thought about, and be patient with one another about. If something is, uh, something is moral to do, uh, in, you know, if it's moral for a Christian to do outside of a building, what makes it immoral to do it inside of a building? Now, Keep in mind that you know, a church building, a building the church uses, you know, we have to be good stewards of what God has provided. We have to be good stewards of the money that has been raised to help us to enjoy uh, these assets and things that's been given. And we need to be good stewards of it. And we need to be mindful of that and respectful of others. But we also need to realize that there's no violation of eating within a church building, having a common meal together. Now, the Corinthian church they were rebuked because they were co-mingling the Lord's Supper and a common meal together, and they were doing all these kinds of things together in their worship service. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, is there anything wrong when the worship service is over and a congregation just gets together and they eat a meal, whether it's out on the church property, whether it's in the church building, or whether it's some rented place that they rented, or whether, you know, is it wrong? Is it wrong for him to do that? It's not. Well, how can we know that? Well, there's several reasons uh, that we can know that. But I want, to, I want you to think about this quote. You know, the idea of church buildings, it's sort of new. I mean, it's really old. 
But you might want to think about the idea of, you know, did the church just own property right off the bat? Maybe, maybe not. Take a look at this quote. This is from Everett Ferguson's book. It's a little long, so I'll have to read it to you. But this is from his book, um, Early Christians Speak. Now, this is what he says. Separate structures built by Christians specifically as meeting places belong primarily outside our chronological limits. His chronological limits here is the first three centuries. That's what he's talking about. The first reference to the church buildings are sometimes found in Clement of Alexandria, but there seems to be no reason to take ecclesia in other than its common meaning of assembly without any reference to a building. Although the passage clearly implies a recognized building where the assembly occurred, having a better claim, if the sources are reliable, are the Chronicles of Abella, compiled about 550 AD, but based there on the second century record which reports that Bishop Isaac from 123 to 136 was responsible for building a church and the Chronicles of Edessa, which says that a building of the Christians was destroyed in the flood in 202, both of which are Syriac sources. There is no way of knowing whether these buildings differed in Constantine peace. Virtually all church buildings that are known were houses or commercial buildings modified for church use. Now he goes on to write, any space where an assembly was permitted was a possible site for Christian gatherings. You know, see, that's, I mean, that's an important point. You know, sometimes when we build these buildings and, and we become attached to them and we worship in them all the time, sometimes, if we're not careful, we can view the brick and mortar and stained glass and bells and carpet and, and pews and all. If we're not careful, we can adopt a kind of an attitude where we think, well, this is the church. This is the church. We can't use it for other purposes other than what the purpose of the church is. But one of the purposes of the church is to have fellowship one another. You see, that's important to keep in mind. What's the difference between eating in a building or eating on church property outside of a building? There's really no difference. There really is no difference. And I encourage you to really think about that. You know, and, and again, I don't really, you know, I don't want to harp on people that have the viewpoint that you can't do it. I just want them to understand that not everybody's agreed with that. And I want to be as charitable to them, and hopefully they will be charitable to me as well when I don't agree with them on that point. See, fellowship's really important, something we need to keep in mind. What about the blessings? There are great blessings in fellowship. Let's look at Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 4. Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. Having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Notice there's great blessings there. It's really important that we look at. You know, we, we, we're supposed to be a source of comfort uh, for one another. I mean, that's a tremendous blessing. We all have difficulties we go through. Well, let's go on. Let's look at 1 John chapter 1, uh, 1 through 4. John wrote that which was from the beginning, which we heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father, was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. It's very important that we recognize that we have fellowship uh, with the Father, too. Roy Coddell, in his book, he makes a statement about some of the things that relates to what destroys unity in the church. And he says selfishness was one. Also speculative or hobbyist teachings, or uncontrollable tongues, or peevishness. That's something we need to worry about, something that we need to be on guard about. He also pointed out things that promote unity, generosity, unity in faith and teaching, uh, be at peace with all men as, as much as possible, also the, the importance of love and, and genuine love. We have to do that. Notice what it says in 1 Peter 2, 17, Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Those are things that we need to be involved in. So just to wrap up, what is fellowship? It's communion. It's fellowship participation, sharing with one another. Are there boundaries for it? Yes, there are boundaries. The boundaries is Christ and his word. Areas of fellowship includes worship, serving others, spending time with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. 
Blessings of fellowship should be a growth of love and togetherness. While we grow together with Christ in love, then it continues on into eternity. It never ends. Fellowship, one of the great works of the New Testament church. Thanks for watching our program today. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there and sadly so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map don't even open their Bibles yet and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion, or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people, or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And, that, and the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood, and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the roadmap to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey.